progress. Um, they were able to find some of these other elements that, that, that were there, but it still didn't explain why. And those new elements, what we know now is that those have to do with the electrons. It's the number of electrons that allow things to react, to behave in certain ways. And arranging those electrons in certain configurations allows you to make systems that are more stable or less stable. And it's the stability of those electrons that is responsible for that periodic structure, why it repeats every X elements. Right? And so that really is where, where this, this is a, a colorized picture. It wasn't originally in color um, of, a, uh, of a really cool event back in the, I want to say this is from the 1970s. No, that would have been during World War I still, maybe 1920s. Um, basically, in the early 1900s, one of the first times in history where you could have global collaboration happening in real time more or less. It wasn't until we were able to have people transmit ideas via um, telegraphs and um, transport themselves via trains and boats and things like that around the world. And I say around the whole world, but this is very Northern European looking through here, right? Um, but this laid the groundwork for then eventually bringing in some um, big ideas from places like India and in America as well. Um, and then eventually Japan and China um, are now probably the leaders in science and physics research at this point. Um, but it's, it's still really interesting that you had so many really, really big minds coming up with so many ideas so quickly. That it, it was the time scale that had never happened before. Up until the late 1800s, when scientific research happened, somebody had a good idea, they wrote it down, they wrote a letter to their friend that, or somebody else who researched the same thing, sent their letter away. A month or two later, the letter would get there, their friend would read it, have some thoughts on it, send a letter back. But it was like a six month process at the fastest. The invention of the telegraph and trains allowed these people, this research to start happening an order of magnitude faster, 10, maybe even 100 times faster than it did in the early 1800s. And so a lot of what we have today in terms of technology and science is a result of trains and telegraphs. And that really, really sped up transmission of ideas. I mean, now it's even faster, right? With emails and everything like that. I can chat with somebody in Japan about research in real time. I can have a Zoom meeting with a with a and, um, another research group in in Europe right now, anytime I want, right? And so this picture is really, really impressive in that all of these boxes, every box represents a Nobel Prize. Um, and to get this many Nobel Prizes in one place at one time, the ones that have the dots around, they didn't win a Nobel Prize, but their immediate successors did. Their students that worked in the lab with them won a Nobel Prize. And arguably, they should have been included in that Nobel Prize as well. Um, and even the ones that didn't win Nobel Prizes, about half of them have like units named after them, equations and constants named after them that we still use today. We still talk today about um, Bragg diffraction and de Broglie wavelengths and the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Um, let's see, Born is one next to Bohr. So that's um, Born right there. The reason Oppenheimer got put in charge of the Manhattan Project in the US during World War II um, but was because of the work he did with Born, Max Born, I think, um, in the 1920s. So there's some big names not here, but still just really, really incredible to have this many people in one place at one time. And notice the only one who has two boxes, that's Marie Curie. So she actually has nothing to do with the quantum side of things, uh, but she was still the old guard at that point. She um, had been around long enough that uh, she actually voted to name an, atom, an element after herself. She's the only person in history who's ever actually voted to name an element after themselves. Usually people are like humble enough no, 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 I'll have to say, you guys all vote on the elements I discover. Not Marie Curie, she, you know, being, being a very outspoken woman and you have to be outspoken to get where she did at that time. 
She, no, I discovered this. I earned this. This element is named after me. And nobody was going to argue. Um, Chris. Down there. Is that Carl Taylor? His work in statistics and math. Um, and he won a Nobel Prize in physics for his work on that, but he's not one that I know as much about. Um, there are some that I know really well. This guy looking dapper in his bow tie, um, that's that's Schrodinger of Schrodinger's cat in the Schrodinger equation. Um, this one right here, I've never seen a picture of Werner Heisenberg where he doesn't look like a creeper. He's always sort of like punched forward and looking at you funny kind of look, looks a little bit like a rat um i've only seen like six pictures of them six out of six you know that's not that's not great um the green boxes are chemistry nobel prizes red is physics um the other one that i really like my favorite of all time probably is niels Bohr. Uh, because he was the one who wasn't afraid to argue with Einstein, who had already won his Nobel Prize by this point and was regarded as the rock star of the, of the science world. But Niels Bohr was the one who would still argue with him about everything and tell him he was wrong. Um, Niels Bohr was also functionally illiterate. He literally could not write his own dissertation. He had to dictate it to his mother who typed it for him. Um, so it just goes to show you can just because you're bad at one aspect or dyslexic or something like, he probably was undiagnosed dyslexic, but in the early 1900s, they didn't know what that was or how to diagnose it. Um, that doesn't mean you can't be really good at, at science. Um, he always had the, the, the witty retort to Einstein's quotes. You know, Einstein's got the famous quote, God does not play the dice because he really didn't like the implications, the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics. Um, so he said, you know, this can't be right. God does not play with dice. And Niels Bohr was one. Einstein quit telling God what to do. Um, it's, it's, I mean, they really, really debated until late the hours of the night while drinking um, about what the implications were of some of this stuff. Um, because it does actually have philosophical implications as well. Um, if you want more information about who any of these people are, um, let me know. Uh, and I, I have a spreadsheet with all their names, or just you can just look them up. Um, one more fun fact, though, before we move on, is that so Marie Curie's husband died um, well before she did, died in like 1906, something like that. Um, because as, if I'm remembering the story correctly, he got hit by a car in Paris in 1906. There could have only been like three cars in Paris in 1906, but he got hit by one of them running over. Um, and so she was a, a widow for most of her adult life after they had three daughters together. Um, and so she actually had an on, on again, off again um, physical relationship with one of the best mathematicians of the time, Lorenz. They have, you see them next to each other every time you see one of these pictures. Lorenz is sitting next to Marie Curie because they kind of had a, a thing going for decades. And then just because I think it's really cool, Marie Curie's daughter, one of them won a Nobel Prize, her second Nobel Prize, um, she actually shared with her daughter. Um, and one of her other daughters, Mary, um, was a uh, really important person in um, the French resistance during World War II, and wound up marrying this, one of the first secretary generals of the UN. Um, and she was a journalist who purposely on, stayed behind um, to fight in the French resistance and document what was happening in France during World War II, um, despite the fact that, that her family had the means to leave France. The rest of her family did, and she purposely stayed behind. Um, so just really, really fascinating family. Um, oh, and now the UN Secretary General of the UN that her other daughter married won the Nobel Peace Prize. So that, that poor second daughter wound up being the only one who didn't directly get a Nobel Prize. Mom had no, two of them. Dad had a Nobel Prize. Um, husband had a Nobel Prize. And then you had the one who worked, fought in the French resistance and never got a Nobel Prize herself. But just, I really find personal lives of scientists really interesting because there's some really cool stories there. All right, another Niels Bohr quote, just to set the table here. Those who are not shocked when they first come across, across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. Basically, 
it's going to get weird. You're not going to be able to use the way you have thinking, the intuition you have about how the universe works at our scale does not apply to quantum mechanics. Things just plain out don't behave the same way. And so all the ways you have of, that we've learned since you were you know, six weeks old about this is how what happens when you roll a ball off the table, it falls to the ground. That stuff doesn't apply to quantum mechanics. Things work are going to actively work the opposite way sometimes from what we expect. Um, but we can design tests and prove that it's accurate. It's just that things don't behave the same way. And so we have to kind of try to release some of those ideas sometimes um, to try and, and understand what's going on. So a little, a little bit about how waves work. We talked a little bit about waves in, in lab yesterday or today. Um, and we're going to explain a couple more of their properties just qualitatively so we can understand why some of the evidence for quantum mechanics proves what it proves. Um, so we talked about wavelength and frequency and speed of waves a little bit. Um, one of the other things that, that we're able to see with waves is that when you pass waves through a really small hole, they start behaving different. When you pass them through a small hole, they, if you start by having these waves that are all parallel to each other, and then they hit this gap, when they move through the gap, they actually are no longer parallel to each other. It acts like you made another like wave source right there. So if you think of these as being waves like, like in the ocean, you've got rows of waves coming in. When they hit a breakwater that has a little gap in it, on the other side of that breakwater, they come out and they're curved now. And it looks like you dropped rocks right there, like formed more waves, um, which is weird. But at the time, this is one of the ways they had of describing particles versus waves. One of the ways they had of, of doing that, of proving whether something was a particle or a wave, was basically pass it through a small gap and see what happens. If it diffracts like this, it's a wave. If it keeps moving in a straight line, it's a particle. So this would be like, if you think about um, you know, throwing baseballs through a hole in the wall. You're going to miss sometimes the baseball hit the wall, they're going to bounce back. But if you go straight through the hole, the baseball continues on the same path. Right? So we were able to kind of differentiate and say, okay, well, these are waves, these are particles. But the problem is, is that when you get to really small things, if you try doing this trick with electrons, the electrons, when they pass through it, behave like this which was weird, but we can kind of understand it a little bit. If we think, okay, we've gotten these really, really small things. Let's go back to the baseball analogy. Let's say I'm, I throw a thousand baseballs at, the, at a hole. Some of them, I'm gonna clip the edge, right? If I clip the edge, that's gonna send it off at a funny angle. And it might kind of look a little bit like an arc if you mapped out all the different places that the baseballs hit. It might look a little bit more like this if you consider the fact that particle could be interacting with the opening itself. So this is what's when de Broglie, who was back in here as well, de Broglie was one next to Compton and Bourne. So there's de Broglie right there. Um, he, he came up with this concept that, well, maybe there's no such thing as particle or waves. Maybe everything is both a particle and a wave. But when some when particles are big enough, their wave nature gets so small, we can just treat them like a particle. But when the particles get really, 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 really small, they behave just like a wave instead. And so really at a spectrum of wave particle duality is what it was called. Which kind of start started Heisenberg down on his his um, rabbit hole of well, why is that? What's really going on? Because and it turns out, um, this mostly comes back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which was, let me get it better. No, I won't get it better. 
Heisenberg uncertainty principle, when we write it mathematically, is the uncertainty in X times the uncertainty in the momentum must be greater than or equal to it's H over two, where H was that known constant, that Planck's constant that showed up randomly in our equations from lab. The Planck's constant had been observed and measured. They didn't know what it meant or where all the different places it was going to show up. But Heisenberg was able to prove conclusively that you could not know both where something was and its momentum at the same time. If you knew where something was, so this is the uncertainty in position. And this is uncertainty in momentum. When one of these goes down, the other one has to go up. If you know with really, really accurately where something is, your knowledge about its momentum is, is a lot less. Your uncertainty in momentum goes up. And we can kind of understand this kind of qualitatively um, by thinking about the size of the particles we're measuring and how we measure so we measure things basically by bouncing light off of them, right? When we're measuring something, where something is, we, we let photons come from the light, bounce off the object into our eye, and then we can use those photons that are hitting our eye to measure how long something is, for instance, or where something is. If you think about using a radar gun um, to measure where something is, how far away something is. What it's really measuring is how long it takes photons to come out of the radar gun, bounce off the wall, come back. That's how radar works. That's how sonar works. That's, when you get down to it, that's how measuring anything works. Well, what if the object we're measuring is about the same size as the photon? So think about if we have a baseball suspended on a string from the ceiling right here. And I'm over here blindfolded, and my way of figuring out where the baseball is, is that I have a bucket of golf balls I can throw at. And I can tell by the sound if I hit it or not. Well, as soon as I hit the baseball with a golf ball, what's going to happen to the baseball? It's going to start swinging, right? I know where it was a second ago now, but I don't know where it is now, and I don't know how fast it's going. Right, so the fact that we measure anything by bouncing photons off of it or other similarly sized particles means that if we, we get to really, really small things, you can know where it is or you can know how fast it's going, but you can't know both. Right, the, the old physics joke is, there's a, an old physics joke about, um, let's see, let me try to get it right. Um, Schrodinger, Schrodinger and Heisenberg are driving along in a car um, and they get pulled over by a police officer. Uh, and the police officer says to Heisenberg, do you know how fast you're going? He says, no, but I know exactly where I am. And the police officer says, looks at him funny and says, you're going 75 miles an hour in a 45. Says, Great, now I'm lost. And then the police officer thinks that's weird. So he says, I'm gonna need you to get out of the car and show me what's in the trunk. And they open up the trunk. And the officer says, sir, did you know that there, you have a dead cat in your trunk? Well, I do now, asshole. <laughs> Which will make more sense when we get to Schrodinger's cat in a minute. Right, so, but basically we can't, it, it, this is kind of what laid the, the groundwork for things are a particle and a wave because you can't know both where they are and what they're doing. That uncertainty means that you have, you basically are limited in, in your knowledge um, just by the physical nature of the universe. It's not something we could ever improve by having better technology. The universe itself dictates uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and what that uncertainty is. So they start thinking that this is a little bit weird that electrons have some wave part um, properties, but the Broglie comes up with wave particle duality. Cool. 
Um, that kind of explains why why electrons behave a little bit like a wave and a little bit like a particle. Um, then the other issue that starts happening is that they notice that if you pass a, a wave through two slits next to each other, two small gaps, those waves will interfere with each other. And you wind up with constructive and destructive interference. So constructive interference is when you have, you have two waves that run into each other. There's going to be certain places where the two, the two waves kind of add up and you get one new wave that's twice as big as the original. And your lows are twice as low. So have you ever been in a wave pool in a water park? This is kind of what happens there. There's certain spots in the middle of the wave pool where you go up higher and lower. And there's certain spots where it's, you could hang out there and nothing ever changes. You stay in the same spot no matter what. That's because the waves, the two wave generators in that wave pool are, are interacting with each other to create this constructive and destructive interference. So de destructive interference means you get a peak and a trough running into each other at the same time, which cancels each other out. Constructive interference is if you get two peaks in the same time, they add up. So, okay, cool. So we already know lights and waves, so no big deal with wave particle duality. Um, we start seeing the issue though is right at the same time, Einstein is winning his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, which is partly proving that light is also a particle and a wave, but it doesn't have a mass we can measure. We've got this wave that occurs in discrete packets that they call quanta. And those discrete packets don't have any mass. So it's not really a particle at all. They have wave, part, wave properties, but it's like a wave that it's not a wave in something else. It's a wave within itself or a wave in the fabric of space. In a way that we can't really see other than by measuring light. Um, and so this, the foot metals, if that light is frequency, you can get those messages that you see. Light in my it's already the high energy. Um, you can get electrons to fly off of that. What I'm Einstein proved with the, when he studied the photoelectric effect was it didn't matter how many photons you shined on it if they were low if they were low in energy. So basically, there's some frequency of light, and it doesn't matter what the the amplitude was, or sorry, it didn't matter how many how much light you shined on it, how intense the light was. If it was below some certain threshold of frequency we couldn't get any electrons to fly out. But as soon as you cross, cross that threshold frequency, then the amount of electrons you got was directly proportional to the intensity of the light. So that seems a little bit weird. It seems like a bit of a stretch to say, therefore photons exist. But that's basically why Einstein won a Nobel Prize for it. So he was able to take this, it didn't make any sense, tie it into wave particle duality that was happening simultaneously, Say, oh, light's a wave and a particle, despite the fact it has no mass. It must be because otherwise there would not be this random threshold. Otherwise, you should be able to get some amount of electrons to fly off at high intensity light, even at lower frequency. So this is what eventually led to these, these equations that we used in lab. Remember that this Greek, this is um, the Greek letter nu. Um, and if you, if you do that substitution with speed of light equals frequency times wavelength, if you solve for frequency and plug it in there, you get this combined version that has wavelength involved instead of frequency. Just because for whatever reason, we measure light more, more often in, um, in terms of wavelength rather than frequency. I don't know why, for some reason, 
At some point, it was decided that we would measure sound in terms of frequency and light in terms of wavelength. It would make more sense if we just measured it all in frequency, but then our units would get screwy probably or be harder to tell what was going on maybe. I don't know. For whatever reason, this form gets used even though this is the simpler equation. But if you have the frequency, it's not hard to get to the wavelength and vice versa, right? If you have, this is a constant about three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So as long as your wavelength is in meters and your frequency is in hertz, it's really easy to convert back and forth between the two. And this H term is that Planck's constant. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. That's a, that's a constant that doesn't make any sense. Those units are weird. Turns out joules times seconds is in units of entropy, which they hadn't even defined at this point really yet. Or if they had, they didn't think it was related to quantum because it was more about statistics than it was anything else they thought. Turns out the way statistics works at really large scales mirrors the way quantum works at really small scales. They're linked in a way that wasn't entirely obvious at the time. Why is it HC just one constant? Is it going to be the same every time? Um, because, because there are lots of equations that, that have H but not C, and there are lots of equations that have C but not H. So rather than have one more constant to memorize, I don't know what H times C is, but I know what H is, and I know what C is to memorize. So I think it's just more out of a uh, a sense of keeping keeping those things separate um, so we can remember where they came from. H is uh, Planck's constant, right? Yes. Again, spelled, and I didn't make the same, didn't tell my class this morning the same thing. My Eastern European um, professor in grad school threatened to fail anybody who said Planck um, because it's Planck. You can't say Planck, it's Planck. Um, he also did the same thing. This is or, uh, a, a physical organic chemistry. There's a, a really important thing in organic chemistry called um, Huckel's rule, but it's spelled with the umlaut, which means you pronounce it Huckel's rule. That one he was actually more death on than, than Planck's constant. He wasn't as bad about Planck's constant. If you said Huckel, he was going to let you have it. Um, he was a really interesting fellow. He, was, he sat down first day of class and he said, okay, so what is an orbital? You've known this since kindergarten. Let's do the, let's do the three-dimensional integral. This is, a, this, this is organic chemistry. We're not supposed to do math in organic chemistry. Um, it's, you, it's what he always said. Anytime nobody wanted to answer one of his questions, oh, you've known this since kindergarten. Every time. Was I supposed to learn that? Or are you being unreasonable? I just don't know. All right, so figuring out how light works and the different frequencies of light led us to understanding what the electromagnetic spectrum was, which was basically that light doesn't have to just exist in the frequencies we can see. We're only able to detect with our eyes things that are in a frequency or that are in the, um, the visible range, which in terms of wavelength is about 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers. That's the range we can see visibly. But if you if you start measuring light outside of that range, you start seeing all this other stuff that we didn't really fully understand. Some of it we thought was totally separate, which is why nuclear radiation is considered a separate thing than just light. But radiation, light is just radiation. We just had a separate word or visible light compared to the stuff Marie Curie was measuring. Just because we didn't even realize it was the same stuff, it was such so high energy. And so, and as you can see, we start getting some really, really big frequencies, really, really big differences in um, wavelength. And it turns out, and this is just kind of interesting aside, um, if you look at where a lot of these, what we consider radio waves show up in microwaves, they're well below infrared. Um, and 
anything, if anything's going to cause, I just say this because I always get questions about, do microwaves really cause cancer? Can, can your cell phone give you a brain tumor? Um, stuff has to be up around here in terms of energy, highest energy stuff. Anything from here up, yeah, that's going to give you cancer. Long-term or short-term, either way. It gets more and more dangerous the further up you go. Microwaves, cell phones, FM radio, TV signals, they're all way down here. They're not, they're what's known as non-ionizing radiation. They literally don't have enough energy to actually cause any sort of mutations or damage to your cells. At most, they can warm your cells up, which is what a microwave does, right? It relies on the fact that things that have water, that water absorbs and gets warmed up by certain frequencies of light that happen to be in that region. So just to head back those questions off at the pass, so to speak, um, no, just because this radiation doesn't mean it's causing cancer or even can cause cancer, um, doesn't mean that you should be spending more time on your cell phones, but that's, a, that's more of a societal thing than a, a danger to getting cancer thing. All right, let's do some practice with these equations. So. Here are the equations we're going to use, and I'll, I'll rewrite the two, the two key equations up here in a second. If we have orange light that has a wavelength of 650 nanometers, what is the frequency of that light? And what is the energy of one photon at that frequency? So reminder C is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Oops. Oh. If I can do that without it, trying to change. There we go. So you've done the pre lab and you've done the calculations. You've already done this before, but let's do it one more time. Cement it in. So our frequency is just going to be 3.00 e to the 8 meters per second over 6.5. We call it two sig figs. I left it ambiguous when I wrote it up there. Oops. Times 10 to the minus 7 meters. If you convert nanometers to meters, you're shifting the decimal place by 10 to the 9. So visible light is always going to have a wavelength that's in the 10 to the minus 7 range for meters. And we get something like, what, five times 10 to the 14? Ish? I got 4.6. I'll take it. And what are our units on it? What happened to our units? Yeah, you got meters per second divided by meters. So meters cancels meters, and we're just left in one over seconds. Which we defined a new name for that we used kind of as an example earlier. We didn't spend a lot of time with it. What do we call it? one over seconds? Hertz. Or sometimes you see it written as seconds to the negative one. So you don't have to write a fraction when you're writing your units if you're typing. So it's a lot easier to do exponents than it is to put in a fraction. Um, so sometimes you see it written as, because any anything to the negative one is one over that number, right? So seconds to the negative one is just another way of writing one over seconds. And the way we're most used to seeing it is Hertz, capital H, lowercase z. 
Cool, we've got a frequency. What's the energy of one photon with that frequency? Right here. So, energy equals H, that really tiny number, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds times 4.6 times 10 to the 14 one over seconds. It's something like 3.0 times 10 to the minus 19. What about units? Joules. Joules. We had our hertz, remember, it is one over seconds. And our units on H are joules times seconds. So we have seconds on top, seconds on bottom. Seconds cancels out, and we're just left in joules, which is an energy unit. That's the energy of one photon at that frequency. So if we want to know the energy of a mole of photons. Now we're back in familiar conversion territory. If it's joules per one photon, then if we wanted to be more descriptive with our units, we could say joules per photon, right? If we have a mole of photons, we can say, okay, well, I want to cancel out photons. Photons is on the bottom. So 6.022, 10 to the 23rd photons is one mole. Photons cancels photons. So we're just going to take that and multiply by 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 23rd. which gives us about 1.8 times 10 to the fifth. So 1.8 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole. Cool. We did some math. We made the units work out just to see what the question asked for. What does that number actually mean? Is that a lot of energy or not very much energy? Not very much. We, that's, that's and really it depends on our frame of reference. So we need more context to be able to say one way or the other. Compared to, I don't know, a ton of TNT exploding, probably not very much energy. Compared to a double A battery, maybe about this. I don't know. So. It's helpful sometimes to put it in, in more units. So if we put this in kilojoules, it'd be 1.8, it'd be 180 kilojoules per mole. Kilojoules is a common, pretty common unit. And there are four, there are four calories, no, four joules for every calorie. So to put it into nutritional units, since we all have some understanding of what nutritional calories are. Um, this would be about 40 kilocalories, roughly, 180 divided by 5, 4, getting within the back of the envelope um, calculation. So about a, with a, maybe a, a third of a, of a can of Coke, as far as calories go. For how many photons that is, that's not very much, right? We're going to keep adding more and more to our, our knowledge of, or give more and more context to what energy units mean, because that isn't, without context, we don't know a whole lot. Um, it's going to wind up being that that's roughly most reactive.
reactions that happen at room temperature are going to have a change in energy that's in that same ballpark. 100 to 200 kilojoules per mole is about a fairly standard number for energy for reactions to happen in my lab. All right. So just because this chapter and, and these topics as a whole are really, really kind of weird. This is one of the few actionable items, one of the few like skills from this chapter that I can actually test you on is can you take a frequency and turn it into energy or take a wavelength and turn it into energy, right? Other than that, this is going to be a very conceptual chapter, but I still wanted to bring it back to conversions and math so we don't forget how to do that. Matt, where you just say That's the definition of H, so your conversion chain. It's it's like 2.54. It, it is a definition. It's the measured number, um, so it does have six figs, but it's not something that you ever have to memorize. Does that look familiar? You might even be able to recognize what elements those are. Any guesses? Hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. I would have said that that's probably hydrogen because it's a, not quite as red, but we are looking at a projection on the screen. So, but point is, you guys have some understanding of what these are, right? Um, or at least kind of what we're looking at. And that probably is, is mercury, but it could also be argon or, or uh, krypton. They also glow a pretty like bluish white light. So, all of this understanding of light in electrons. Um, uh, here's the other it's the other example that we can do that we do sometimes. These are called flame tests. Um, take, it turns out if you take any one of those elements that we've been talking about, if you take them and you dissolve them in water or methanol and you hold it over a Bunsen burner, um, when you heat it up enough, you basically do the same thing that we did with by passing the voltage through them. When you pass a big enough voltage from top to bottom, you pass electrons through, you got, got it to glow. Turns out if you just heat it up enough, you can have the same thing happen. Um, and so you can actually identify what elements you have just by what color the, the flame glows when you hold a sample over it, um, which is, again, one way that we actually can measure what other planets are made out of without ever getting a sample back. We know what Jupiter is made out of, and it has not because we can bring it back and test it here, just by looking at what color it is and what color light it absorbs from the sun. Right, so the same way that we can look at a spectrum like helium. So those of you who looked at helium might have seen something kind of similar to this, although I don't think we saw these ones very much, right? There was not much in the way of uh, red that we could see in the helium tubes, if I'm remembering right, maybe. <clears throat> maybe one of them. Um, but if we just look at these and compare, okay, well, this is helium. Barium might look really similar to, to the naked eye. You look at these colors, but if you split it up by using one of those diffraction gratings, by using the prism, we can tell that these are not the same thing. Even though they might look, both might glow the same color to the human eye, when we split it up like this, that allows us to basically treat each of these as a barcode that identifies what elements you have. If you have a line at this specific wavelength and these specific wavelengths, it must be high helium. Right? Sorry? It's unique to every element. It's its own emission. This is called an emission spectrum. It's emitting the light, it's glowing. Um, and when we spread it all out, they don't actually have the full spectrum. So white light just looks like a rainbow, but each of these individual elements is gonna have its own sort of characteristic colors that show up. Hydrogen is different than helium, is different than oxygen, is different than barium, right? So that's also how we can look at different stars that are you know, billions of miles away never have any hope of ever getting a probe all the way there and back and still we know what they're made out of because we can look at 
what lines show up and compare that, to assuming that these laws of physics hold true for the entire universe, because we have no reason to suspect they don't. Laws of physics are constant everywhere on Earth makes, and everywhere in the solar system. It makes sense that the laws of physics are constant everywhere in the universe. That is an assumption we make, but that's a decent assumption, it seems like. We don't have any evidence against it anyway. Um, that allows us to say, oh, those stars are definitely hydrogen and helium because it matches the spectrum of our sun, which is all hydrogen and helium. The other interesting thing that shows up, this is what happens when they glow. It turns out they absorb the same frequencies that they glow with. If you pass a current through them, you can get them to glow a certain, a certain color. It turns out if you shine white light on the same sample, it won't glow that color. You'll actually wind up with those lines missing. You see these gaps here, these black spots? So this is what's called an absorption spectrum, which is the literally the exact opposite of what we did in lab. Instead of seeing a couple lines show up, you look at what's missing. And in that, those gaps can tell you things. So even though Jupiter doesn't glow and Mars doesn't glow, it doesn't emit photons, we can, we can look at the light from the sun and say, okay, well, the light from the sun looks like this. You know, it's basically this sort of bell curve that's centered right around the yellow wavelengths, um, right around six, uh, 570 nanometers. And when that light hits Mars and then bounces to our telescopes, it's missing certain chunks. The chunks that are missing tell us what it's made of. Right? And that's also what gives it its characteristic red color is the fact it's not absorbing red photons, but it is absorbing green photons. And so when you shine white light on it, what bounces back is the stuff that doesn't get absorbed. So to our, our eye, that would look red. And so this is where color theory from, from art also comes into play, right? Anybody remember doing color wheels in you know, elementary school and things like that, or taking art classes? Our eye perceives it as kind of a wheel where you can subtract something over here from white light and it looks like the opposite. Even though it's really more of a spectrum like this, our, the way our brain perceives light is really weird that way. Um, it's not actually cyclic, and it's not really that blue is the opposite of orange. But the way our brain perceives it is that when you subtract out all of the orange, what's left looks blue to us. So color theory and art and color theory and physics are related, but they're almost opposites from each other. Because in art, you're looking at what you mix together to make it appear a certain color. Versus in physics, we're talking, in chemistry, we're talking about what do we subtract out to make it look like the opposite. But they, all, they do all still come together. It all still works together. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at five after. We'll break down this equation again. This is the one that we were looking at in our lab. How did they figure out? Um, Joe. I'm blanking on it right now. Yes. I'm really tired. Uh, well, let's look it up. Thank you. 
What's the difference between the and the land? You know, like two different groups of these analysis, right? What's the difference between those two? So the energy level is by the electrons. So that's our next step is we're going to start talking about about the model basically. So these lower layers in the periodic table have more electrons in them. If they have more electrons, they have more shells that have to be filled up. So they can make more. As far as like what, what it looks like on, um, on the periodic table is basically once you get above a certain size element. Um, the nuclei aren't stable long term, and so they will all be radioactive above a certain level. But that doesn't mean that they're not found in nature necessarily. Uranium is not found in nature, or sorry, it is found in nature, even though it's above that threshold. And it's every isotope of uranium is it's radioactive and above the same, but it's at a really low rate. So, questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if your wavelength is 100 times 10 to the minus 7, or 1 times 10 to the minus 7, it's up here in the UV. Which puts it up in that between, you know, a near ten to the sixteen range as far as frequency goes. Yeah. So it's outside the visible range, therefore we can't see it. If we were measuring, if we had a detector that was that was detecting light in the UV, it would be able to see that. We'd be able to measure it. It's just not with these. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When you get a simple explanation that makes sense, don't go second guess. All right.
Let's keep going. Let's recap what happened in my apple today. When we looked at hydrogen in my you know, we wound up with only a few lines, right? This should look fairly familiar, other than the fact we were also looking for one more line over here, too. We tried to find four, four lines. Um, that was the second one was the one that was right at the edge of UV. So depending on your set, your exact setup, which hydrogen tube you got, how bright it was, um, you may or may not have been able to see that second one. But so these are these are what led to Bohr's model was the fact that we could observe these distinct lines of the emission spectra. And it was noticed there was this, this physical law where if you plot it, the weight one over the wavelength of light was equal to a constant R, that Rydberg constant, which we're going to use R again as a constant later. Um, this particular R is the Rydberg constant, and it only really shows up once. And we very quickly will make this equation obsolete and we'll ignore this equation moving forward. Um, because as we found out once we looked at uh, the free lab, we can calculate the change in energy by looking at the energy of different weight, uh, different um, energy levels. We don't actually need to use this equation. We don't need R. We can get R just based on Planck's constants and and some other fundamental numbers. Um, and so the fact that these that these wavelengths only occurred with when you plug in integers in tied into the fact that they were also figuring out that light was quantized, that light had discrete photons that you could count. Maybe not individually, but they were you couldn't have half of a photon. They figured all of this out right around the same time. So it made sense that this started getting that started thinking, well, if light behaves this way in these discrete packets, and we have these integer numbers showing up in this equation that we don't know why it behaves this way, but we know that it does, then maybe there's some something related there. Right? And so that's what led to four the four model. It's the most common um, model that you see for for atoms in general, because it's a pretty decent way of understanding how electrons behave at a basic level. Um, the, these electrons are attracted to the nucleus in the middle. The closer they can get to the nucleus, the more stable they are, because the nucleus has a positive charge, the electrons are negative. But they're limited into what areas they can be in, what energy levels they can have. Electrons are only allowed to have certain energies because for two reasons. One, the electrons can't fall all the way down to the bottom because if, you, if an electron fell all the way to the bottom, you would know its position and its momentum very, very accurately. So Heisenberg uncertainty principle is you can't have an electron fall all the way down there because then you know everything about it. And that's not allowed. The rules of the universe don't allow us to know everything about an electron. So you can't have them fall all the way down, but you also can't have all of your electrons clustered on top of each other at the exact same distance, at the exact same energy, or even sort of piled up on top of each other. Partly because electrons are all negative. So if the electrons are pushing each other away, at the same time that the nucleus is pulling them in, but also because they behave both like a particle and a wave. They are a particle. We can measure the mass of an electron, but because they're so small, they also behave like a wave. And if you have a wave, waves can only exist in certain ways when we're keeping them stationary. If you have a stationary wave, it's what's known as a standing wave. And there, there are rules for what standing waves are possible. And we'll talk about why in a second. So this is just another really interesting thing that shows that electrons, despite being particles, also have wave properties. If we do the two slit experiment, 
right? We did this with light, right? We saw the constructive interference and destructive interference with light. Okay, well, light's weird. Light's photons, it's a wave and it's a particle. Um, electrons, we know have mass. We know they act as discrete particles, but if you shine electrons and do a two slit experiment with electrons, electrons here, <laughs> Interfere with each other too, the same way that that photons do. So you, you get constructive and destructive interference, the same way that you see it with photons, which is weird because you wouldn't expect if I throw a thousand baseballs at a hole, and okay, maybe you can see it kind of looks a little bit like a wave when it comes through, but you wouldn't expect those baseballs to interfere with each other in terms of causing constructive and destructive interference. And in fact, we can actually do experiments now where we fire really small numbers of, of electrons and actually measure individual electrons. Remember we talked about CRTs and how that was basically the, those cathode ray tubes, they were firing electrons and you had like a, a film and if an electron hit that film, it caused that, that particular um, spot on the film to glow for a second. We can actually do that as a way of measuring where electrons are hitting things. And so if we do that, where we set it up, where we have two slits here and here, and we fire electrons in one at a time to the point where we're measuring individual electrons hitting. As we, at first, it doesn't look all that different, but what we see is we get an interference pattern, constructive and destructive interference, even though we're only firing those electrons one at a time, which means one of two things is happening. Either the electron that we're firing at the beginning knows that there are going to be other electrons and those other future electrons are reaching back into the past to interfere with the electrons that we're firing, which is really out there, but can't be ruled out necessarily. Um, but more likely the electron interferes with itself. The electron behaves entirely as a wave and acts like a wave and causes interference with itself. So until it hits that, that screen at the back where it becomes a particle again, it's both a wave and a particle. And you see properties of both as a result of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle mostly, because you can't know where it is. So it has to act like a wave where it could be in more than one place at once. Um, and it, what gets really interesting is if you change this experiment up, instead of measuring where the electrons are hitting, if you actually measure which slit the electrons go through, that actually forces the electrons to behave like a particle in the interference pattern disappears. They can only interfere with themselves if you don't measure which of the two slits they go through. In other words, in order to cut of this interference pattern, they have to go through both slits simultaneously, but also be a discrete particle. So remember when I said that quantum wasn't going to make any sense, it was going to be totally counterintuitive, and like, you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a little bit? Mathematically and experimentally, we can show that this happens. This is not just like a thought experiment. This really happens. By measuring which slit it goes through, you force it to act like a particle, and it changes the the way it distributes on these screens. Again, really weird. So that uncertainty principle, coupled with the fact that the electrons behave like waves, tells us that we can, we can start applying some of our understanding of waves to the way they behave. So, and if you have a wave with a fixed position, a standing wave, we can understand that a little bit like thinking about it, a guitar string. If you think of a guitar string, when you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates up and down. It has a standing wave. It works because it's fixed at both ends. You can think about trying to, um, you know, any, any stringed instrument you want, or just like a piece of rope, you stretch rope really tight and pluck it. It'll vibrate up and down, right? What happens if you only hold one end of the rope and you try to pluck it? You get a wave? No, right? You, you have to have both ends secured in order for that standing wave to form. 
So if we use that as sort of a condition, in order to have a standing wave, which these electrons behave like, you have to fix the string at both ends of a of a um, of a string. And that means that you can only get vibrations where both ends are stuck where they are, where both ends are fixed and not moving. And so that means we have a couple different, we have a lot of different ways we can do this, but if you if you visualize these as being waves, there's a couple different wavelengths we can have. We can have a wavelength where we the entire distance um, is half of a wave, where if we were drawing this out, the rest of the wave would continue on and we'd have it look like this. So peak, valley, back to the middle. We could also have it with the wavelength set so that you, it's got one entire wave is contained within the box. We have it so that there's one and a half waves contained within a box. You could have it so that there's two entire waves contained within a box, right? but you can't have anything in between. You can't have 1.3 waves. You can have one wave. You can have one and a half waves. You can't have anything in between. There's no way to have a different energy where both ends are fixed at the same point still. Because if we did, if we tried to fit one and a half or one and a third waves in here, let's see, we would get Actually, let's go with the easier one. We'll do um, three quarters of a wave. If we tried to set it up so we had three quarters of a wave, we'd have up, down. Look what happens at the end over here. It's not fixed at the end anymore now, right? That's not a standing wave. You can't have a standing wave where the ends aren't stuck where they are. All right. It's, what that turns into mathematically, I need a keyboard shortcut for erase all the on the slide. If you put these, if you extend the same idea and think about these standing waves as being around in a circle around a positive charge, we get something that's kind of like how electrons behave. It's weird to think about. Think about it, but basically you get a standing wave in a circular motion. So a guitar string vibrating where the ends of the guitar string are connected to each other. Weird, but okay, mathematically, it's basically the same as doing doing this, except with with uh, polar coordinates. Right, the functions would look the same, except you'd have r and theta instead of having x and y. Uh, if you want, I don't know why it keeps doing that. And if you want an explanation with it's more um, focused on on the music side of things, but it shows the actual vibrations and what it sounds like in terms of pitch. So what am I doing? I guess it didn't hyperlink. Uh, there's a pretty good video that I found. Um, first, after I linked one that's more on the physics side of things. Thank you. Thank you for watching that. Can you talk and do my keyboard shortcuts at the same time? Sorry. There we go. Um, this is actually just a, uh, a don't have ad hoc or install apparently. Um, we have to listen to the whole thing. My skip button. Um, it's this uh, the Scottish guitar maker who explains the physics and what harmonics do, and he's got a fun Scottish accent, so it's still understandable. Again, you want to be still there, you know, but it sounds separate. 
So I'll skip some of his, his or explanations to talk about some of this already. But basically, we have all of these happening at once on a guitar string when you pluck it. Um, the lowest energy waves wind up happening most often because of the lowest energy. But you get some amount of these other waves as well, unless you prevent it from vibrating right in the middle. If you prevent it from vibrating right in the middle by holding your finger, you don't have to push the string down, you stop it from vibrating right in the middle, then you see you get only this vibration and this vibration happening at the same time. These ones get canceled out. And so basically, what, but if you try to do that at other points, if you try to introduce a node like that at other points along, right, say right here, we tried to put our finger down and then um, cause this to happen. What happens is you get no vibration at all because this spot right here is not a node for any of these vibrations. All of these different modes will vibrate at that spot that I picked right here. And so you basically can't have any vibration that has that node of no movement happening at that one spot. So what this tells us, the reason this is applicable and why this is worth thinking about, even though this isn't physics or music class, music class is, um, um, that's, that explains why the Bohr model is the way it is. We can't have electrons right here. No. This works better when I'm on my I swear, I was better at doing the technology during COVID than this. You can't have any electrons in that spot right there, because that would be like trying to put a node in that, that spot that just dampens all the vibration. You literally cannot have a standing wave where the electron has that much energy. If you try to do that, it can't exist there. Electrons have to exist at certain energy levels. And those certain energy levels correspond to where you get stable standing waves, which is really weird because energy can exist at any value we want, light can exist at any value we want, but electrons can't just randomly have any energy we want. They're, they're restricted by the charge on the nucleus. and the map that governs how Another way of, of understanding, so let's go back here. So just like with the guitar string, when you plug the, you primarily got that one lowest energy node. In general, if there are multiple options that you can have in the, in the real world, the lowest energy option is the one that's going to predominate over time. The one that's going to be the most common solution over time. So, yes, you can have those other vibrations happening on the guitar string, but the dominant one is going to be the lowest energy. And that's what we see with electrons, too. The most common place to find electrons is going to be in the lowest energy wave or lowest energy um, shell. They refer to these as shells or energy levels. So, you, but then eventually you fill up that, that lowest energy level. You get to a point where you can't fit any more electrons into it. And you can't just stack the electrons on top of that because they're only allowed to exist at certain energies. So it's once you fill up the first energy level, then you start putting electrons into the second energy level. And once you fill up the second energy level, you start putting electrons into the third energy level. And so one physical way of, of thinking about how this happens is if we're trying to, to fill up a bookshelf, from lowest energy to highest energy, it's, your bookshelf is going to be most stable. We think about we're, we're preparing for an earthquake. You don't start by filling up the highest bookshelf with books first, right? If you're worried about an earthquake and an office over on top of you and kill you or something, 
I don't know why you'd be worried about that, but let's say that's the sort of thing that keeps you up at night. You're going to start by filling from the bottom up, right? The lowest energy books get put in first, and then when that bookshelf gets filled up, you go to the next energy level, and then the next energy level. And you can't really have books in between shelves. The analogy gets a little strange there because you could put the book sideways or seven or something like that, right? But let's pretend that that's not an option. So in the way we describe these energy levels, there's a couple of different terms we use that, that I want to define. Um, so the broadest way of understanding the way that, that Niels Bohr explained it was that you have these, they, he called them shells. And he said, okay, you can have, you can have different number of, of electrons in different shells. Um, and you're going to fill from the inside out, from the lowest energy to the highest energy until you run out of electrons, basically. Which was a pretty good way of understanding things. Um, the thing is that not every energy level holds the same number of electrons. As you get to higher and higher energy levels, you start being able to arrange the electrons in different ways and fit more electrons in. And so at its most basic, you start by adding electrons. And then when you fill up an energy level, you go to the next energy level. And when you fill up that energy level, you go to the third energy level or the third shelf. Thought I had a periodic table coming up in here, but let's just go to a periodic table. Turns out to tie it all back here. Hold that thought for one second. Um, the shape of the periodic table that we talked about at the beginning is defined by these energy levels. Mendeleev figuring out the periodic table's shape and putting things in columns, that was a physical law. Quantum mechanics and, and the way electrons fill these energy levels is the theory that explains the shape of the periodic table. The periodic table has the shape it does because every time you go down a row on the periodic table, that corresponds with filling up an energy level and starting the next energy level. So the first energy level on here can only hold two electrons, one, two. And then you fill the first energy level and you go to the second energy level. And the second energy level can hold eight in two different ways. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right, but that's where this comes from and why quantum applies to chemistry specifically is because everything about the periodic table, in other words, everything about chemistry depends on the quantum physics. Everything behaves the way it does in chemistry because it's just applied to physics. Ronnie? So there's like certain limits. There are certain limits, exactly. And so that's what we're gonna go, what we're gonna talk about next. <laughs> is what are the rules for filling these up? And so I like this diagram better because it starts getting into the the types of orbitals you can have within each energy level, All right? So the, the structure of the periodic table is the way that it is because it mirrors the rules that you have to follow when you're adding electrons to a system, right? And so this part here, you could memorize this. Um, I remember that's what I did when I was when I was in your shoes, but that's because I don't think my if my instructor explained it this way, I didn't show up in the class that day, which is totally, I should stop saying that it's because I was not taught this way. I didn't show up at class a lot my first year of college. Um, and so it's totally possible he was a fantastic professor who explained this very well, but considering I had him for other classes later, I don't think that's the case, but generous assumptions. Um, the way that I remember this is by looking at the shape of the periodic table. The shape of the periodic table has this information in it. Again, with the missing ad blocker. Um, if you look at the shape of the periodic table, things show up in groups that we call blocks 
which on our the periodic table that I'm going to give you has them labeled as S block, B block, E block, F block. What that's telling you is that if you're adding electrons in this region, if you're adding the third electron or the fourth electron, you're putting electrons into an S orbital. And it's only two elements wide because an S orbital can only hold two electrons. Over here, that's the P block. If you're adding the sixth electron, you're putting it into a P orbital. So if you want to know where you're putting the electrons, what the electrons look like, what their energy levels look like, all you really have to do is know how many electrons you have, which is why we started by being able to count electrons based on charge. And then all you have to do is be able to count along with the periodic table. If you have 10 electrons and you want to know what that looks like as far as energy levels go, you start at one and you follow the atomic number until you get to 10. And the way that we write that, everybody has their periodic table, right? Of course, that's what I like to hear. So I don't need to keep going back to it because I can do this mentally more or less, but if we wanna know what that, or the, if we wanna describe that without having to write it out as, okay, here's, here's an S orbital in the first energy level. Here's the second energy that has, or the second energy level that has an S orbital. And then the second energy level that has a P orbital. And each of these little boxes can hold two electrons. If we wanna know what the electron configuration looks like for something that has say 10 electrons, we start the low energy so on the y-axis, we just have the energy increasing. So start by putting electrons at the bottom. When you fill up the first energy level, you go to the second energy level. We've added four electrons there. We need to get to a total of 10, so we have six more electrons to add. So if we add 10 electrons, we fill up the first energy level, we fill up the S orbital from the second energy level, we fill up the P orbital from the second energy level. In the shorthand, rather than writing this out every time, we would say that that's 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. And I'll explain what this means. The one, the number in front of each of these is what energy level is it? The letter is the type of orbital that has the electrons in it. And the exponent doesn't mean squared or to the sixth power. It's just telling you how many electrons are in that orbital. So what this is saying is your first energy level has an S orbital with two electrons in it. Your second energy level has an S orbital with two electrons in it. Your second energy level also has a P orbital with six electrons in it. All right, so this is what's known as the electron configuration of an atom or an ion. And this is the other big skill from this chapter is being able to write the electron configuration for an atom or for, um, or for, for a, an ion, right? And it comes back to this. It comes back to, we can predict what these different energy levels are Basically, that Bohr model that had the different energy levels where you calculated the energy of n equals two is this, the energy for n equals three is this. The thing is, the Bohr model only works if you have only one electron. As soon as you have more than one electron, the fact that the electrons push each other away means they behave in a different way, and you have to incorporate other types of orbitals in there. You can't just treat it as n equals one, n equals two, n equals three. Right, so Bohr's model is great, but it, you can't use it for calculations because as soon as you get more than one electron in there, it falls apart. Right, and so the, the other figure, where is my, that I want to look at is, 
um, is a molecular orbital or molecular orbital energies. Let's see what the sign is. Figures. I like it in the record. You know what? We're going to do this by hand. That's going to actually work better than spending our time doing this. All right. So it always starts at the bottom, lowest energy. is always 1s, and it can hold to a, instead of boxes, I'm just gonna draw a line. And when we fill it in, we draw an arrow up and an arrow down. That's two electrons. Electrons are allowed to be in the same space as long as their arrows are facing opposite directions. You're not allowed to have two electrons in the same space with identical properties because they'd be the same particle. We can't have the same particle in the same space. But as long as one of them has the arrow pointing upward, that's a property that we call spin. And basically what it means is the energies are all identical, but if we treat these, these electrons as though mathematically they look like um, they have angular momentum and they're spinning. And if you, you can have this two electrons in the same spot, as long as one is spinning one direction, one spinning the other direction. They're not physically spinning, um, but the math mathematically it's equivalent to you could have a negative sign or a positive sign to indicate which direction it's rotating and still get the same amount of energy. And that allows two electrons to be in the same place at the same time. Basically, they can't interact with each other if they have opposite spins. So that's why we can put two electrons into each one of these lines or boxes is because one's going to be spin up and one's going to be spin down. Um, the running, the running joke, the, the meme about electron spin is um, electron spin is really easy to understand. It's just like you had a ball spinning, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. Other than that, it's the same thing. Once we fill up that first S, we can put into the second energy level. Then we get the two P, which can hold three pairs of electrons. Then we fill the second energy level. That's the end of the second row of the periodic table. We go to the third row of the periodic table, and we're back in the S block. If you're following along, once you, after you get to 10, which is neon, you get to 11, which is sodium, which is back in the S block. With, then you jump over that middle section again, back over to the P block, and you can have electrons in the 3P. Then it gets a little bit weird because after you finish 3P, you go to the fourth energy level. And actually, let me, we're going to color code this. You get to the fourth energy level because you're back in the S block. So it can hold two electrons again. But the weird part is that then you get to that middle section that D block and the first D orbital actually still belongs to N equals three. It's still part of that third energy level, even though we don't fill it up till later. Because, and that's because it's actually higher in energy than the four X. And so we're always filling from the bottom up in terms of energy. We fill in the four S before we go back and fill up three D later. And there's a couple of ways that you can remember that that first row of the D block is really belongs in the third row or in the third energy level. It's basically every time you go up a new energy level, you add a new type of orbital. Mathematically speaking, there are new solutions that you can get um, every time you go from n equals one to n equals two. And as you can think of it, it's all the way down to n equals zero. n equals zero has no orbitals. N equals one has one orbital. N equals two has two types of orbitals, S's and P's. N equals three has three types of orbitals, S, P, and D. N equals four has four types of orbitals, S, P, D, and then you get to F. 
which is those bottom two rows. Those bottom two rows, actually, if we included them in the periodic table where they should be, they should be in between the S block and the D block. In the first row of that, of those, um, of that bottom section actually belongs to N equals four. And so when we're filling these out, when we're writing our electron configurations, all you have to do is follow along on the periodic table and then just know that your D orbitals are offset by one level. And your F orbitals are off offset by two energy levels. So let's do some practice where we can work on that. So we're going to practice just writing the electron configuration. You don't need to draw the whole energy diagram and boxes and arrows if you follow along on your periodic table. So oxygen. Oxygen, when it's neutral, has how many electrons? Eight. Eight. So we need to do an electron configuration where the X or where the superscripts add up to eight. That'd be a total of eight electrons. And where do we start? Okay. We always start at the very lowest energy, which is always 1s. And if you have more than two electrons, it's always going to be 1s2. Then we fill the first energy level, right? We fill the finish the first row of the periodic table. So we go to the second energy level which is back to the S orbital, and it can, that S orbital can also fit to it. We're still in the second row of the periodic table, so it's still the second energy level. Three. We jump over to the P orbital, which can hold, it can hold up to six. How many do we need it to hold? Eight. We need a total of eight. So there's two, there's two. We have four left, right? 2P4. No, they really just run them together. If you're being really, really careful, then they italicize the S's and the P's. But if you write it like this, everybody's going to know what you're talking about. All right, how about selenium? When selenium, Se, is neutral, how many electrons does it have? 34. 34. So we're going to do the same thing, follow along with the periodic table until we get to a total of 34 electrons, or until you reach selenium on your periodic table, if you're looking at one. Count along, and you fill this in, and keep adding until you get to selenium. So 1s2. 2s2, it's always going to start the same way. 2p6, six. Six. there's six elements across in the p block, so we can fit six electrons there. All right, 10 electrons down, another 24 to go, right? We finished the second row of the periodic table, so we go to the third row, and we're back in the s block. Two. We don't say squared, just it looks like squared. We say 3s2, just to, so we don't think about actually squaring things. It turns out when you square orbitals, things get weird. 3p6. Now we're up to 18 electrons. Another 16 to go. Just like with our conversions, I'm just going to continue down here since I'm trying to write large. Finish the third row. So now we're in the fourth energy level. S can hold two or S2. It's a D orbital. And remember that that's a weird one. 10. So 4S2 goes before 3D10? It does because it's lower in energy. But then you go back and you finish filling up 3D10, and then you can come back to 4P. So it's just that D block is offset by one row. 4P4. Four, four. Oxygen and selenium are in the same column, aren't they? In the periodic table? Yeah. Everything in the same column of the periodic table will almost always end the same way. It's in a different energy level, but they both end in a p orbital that has four electrons in it. This is why Mendeleev's periodic table has the shape that it does. 
is because that periodic function corresponds to finishing filling up one energy level and starting the next. And it ratchets back like a typewriter to the other side and starts going across again. Then you fill that energy level up and you go back and start over again until you run out of electrons. And so you can memorize this. You can memorize there's a lot of different ways. If you've taken a chemistry class and not from me before, you may have seen it written as something like 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, uh, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, where, and then you just start by writing arrows. And every time you get to the end, you start at the next level over. And that some people find this helpful for remembering the right order to fill things up. I don't like that because I think it's easier just to understand how the periodic table is set up. Because if you try to use this approach and you miswrite this when you're writing it out on your paper or your test, you're in trouble, right? But you always have your periodic table with you. Other than, and this is where we'll end with some good news. Um, I feel like Professor Farnsworth. People start watching Futurama. Is Futurama still on? Yeah. Okay. Um, good news, everyone. Um, we're going to have your only time I'm going to take away your periodic table is a week from Thursday. Do in class quiz. I know on Canvas it says this Thursday. It's a week from Thursday. I'm, you're going to have. I'm going to take away your periodic table. It's just a test on you know the symbols and the names of everything on the periodic table. The whole thing. But what the, all that means is you don't need to know any numbers. You don't need to know where it goes on the periodic table. You just have to be able to say, if I say AU, you need to be able to write gold. If I write silver, you need to be able to write AG. I picked two of the ones that aren't cognates um, for some reason. But for the most part, you already know them. If I write fluorine, fluorine's F. Say so sulfur, sulfur's S. You already know most of them. Flashcards will be your friends. And I'm definitely going to focus on the ones towards the top, but everything's fair game. There'll be at least one from down in that seventh row somewhere. All right? So a week and a half, a week and two days. Get those down. And then if you do it well, you'll never have to worry about the that again. Okay? Okay. A little bit.